Our last speaker this afternoon is Jean-François Bédard. Jean-François Bédard is associated professor at Syracuse University School of Architecture and received his doctoral degree in the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University. His research focuses on the architecture and the visual culture, culture of court society in early modern France. His publications include decorative games, ornament, rhetoric, and novel culture in the work of Gilles Marie Opno, University of the Lawe Press, 2011, political renewal and architectural revival during the French Regency. Op North Palais Royal in the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians, Bouquier's Prince after Op North Ripa in Quinquadre, and Beds and Throws, Reforming Holy Space in Late 18th Century France in the Journal of Art Historiography. Forthcoming essay will be included in the new edition of Sir Banish. Benister Fletcher's History of Architecture, in the Companion to 18th Century Architecture, Blackwell, and in Journal 18th. Fellowship and Visiting Scholarship from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Paul Getty Foundation, the Craze Foundation, the Graham Foundation for Visual Arts, the Canadian Center for Architecture, and the Institut National Littoral in Paris have supported his work. So Center for inviting me to this extremely interesting conference and this beautiful exhibition, and also Jean Philippe for his uh, constant support. So, what I'll be talking today, you'll see there is theme. Can you hear me? Not well. Not well. Should I? Just speak louder. Just speak louder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, what, what I want to talk about today, and you'll see that themes, of course, intersect with uh, what our previous speakers have talked about, is really how the forms, neo-medieval forms, have been used, have been implemented by Percy and Fontaine for Napoleon's propagandist program uh, and for the creation of the empire. So we have a tendency, of course, to relate Percy and Fontaine to neoclassicism, but as Jean-Philippe has demonstrated, uh, Percy specifically is much broader in terms of his uh, tastes and um, <coughs> proclivities. Like most of their contemporaries, Charles Percier and Pierre-François Léonard Fontaine believe that artists must imitate Greco-Roman forms. In the introduction to their inf influential Recueil des Décorations Intérieures, published in 1801, they wrote, quote, we will have fulfilled our task if we could congratulate ourselves to have helped spread and preserve in the ever-changing decorative arts, which are led by personal opinion and caprice, the principles of taste that we found in antiquity, which are linked, although by a less visible thread, to the general laws of truth, simplicity, and beauty that should guide for eternity the designs resulting from imitation. Yet three years later, they erected for Napoleon, uh, for Napoleon's coronation ceremony at Notre Dame, an elaborate uh, neo-Gothic decor. This was a first in the public representation of the French state. Its influence was considerable. After the empire's fall, the restored Bourbon monarchy adopted the same style for its religious pageantry. Paradoxically, Restoration monarchs embrace medieval forms to demarcate themselves from Percy and Fontaine's elegant neoclassicism, the style empire, closely associated with the Napoleonic regime. The inconsistency between Percy and Fontaine's belief in the timeless beauty of classicism and their use of neo-medieval forms is less puzzling than it appears. As Jean-Philippe Garic has reminded us, Percy had already embraced medieval architecture as a student at the French Academy in Rome. 
On his way to Rome, he praised medieval building, such as the Cathedral of Piacenza, the Basilica of St. Petronio in Bologna, and the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence. Back in France, Percier continued his studies of pre-Renaissance architecture. He left numerous drawings on Notre Dame Cathedral in Chartres, Notre Dame in Paris, and the Cathedral Basilica of Saint-Denis. Percy's knowledge of medieval architecture served him well. In need of legitimacy, Napoleon conjured the memory of the founders of the French state. He identified with the Frankish king Clovis, founder of the Merovingian dynasty and first Christian king of France, and the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne, the first Carolingian ruler. Napoleon and his advisors undoubtedly pushed for neo-medieval forms as a shorthand for their venerable reigns. Of course, Percy and Fontaine's decorative neo-Gothic hardly corresponded to the forms Merovingian or Carolingian masons actually used. The architect's version of medieval architecture su 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 sufficed nonetheless to underline Napoleon's association with the power and piety of his forebears. Percy and Fontaine fused medieval and imperial imagery in the coronation decor. In front of, the, of Notre Dame's main portal, in the center of its facade, they erected the principal feature of their design, an arcaded cubic portico resting on four square pillars topped with obelisks. To harmonize the portico with the cathedral's facade, they divided its elevation into three registers that matched those of the church's west front. At the lowest level, they placed statues and niches that corresponded to the location of the portal's column statues destroyed during the revolution. They opened the portico's middle register with, a large, with large pointed arches that repeated the cathedral's central archway known as the Portal of Judgment. These they flanked with pillars decorated with niches in the manner of the buttresses that separate the three portals of the church's west facade. At the top, they replicated the cathedral's gallery of kings with a continuous band of statues in niches surmounted by a parapet. <coughs> so here's the elevation um, published by Pessine Fontaine. Bastien Fontaine inscribed a symbolic equilateral triangle in the portico, portico's facade. At its base, they placed statues of Clovis and Charlemagne, enthroned and holding uh, attributes of royal and imperial power. They crowned the apex. They crowned the apex with Napoleon's arms. With this compositional device, they con concretized the alleged <coughs> Frankish foundations of the empire. They also sized the portico so that the medieval bas-relief of Christ sculpted on the Portal of Judgment's tympanum, occupy the center of this political trinity. This diagram proclaimed Napoleon's renewed alliance with the Roman Catholic Church, formalized with the Concordat of 1801. To stress dynastic continuity, Napoleon did not only rely on Piercine Fontaine's Neo-Gothic. The emperor insisted that the so-called honneur de Charlemagne, the accessories traditionally used in French coronations, be restored, and actually recreated, really, for the ceremony. The honor remained purely symbolic. <coughs> uh, however, for he only utilized his personal insignia during the imperial uh, ritual. So you see, uh, these are the two imperial insignia, so the, the eagle and the majestis. So those were created specifically for Napoleon. And the other ones, the fake Charlemagne ones, I'll show you uh, in a moment. In the months preceding the coronation, Napoleon commanded Dominique Vivant de Nom, director of the museum, the future Louvre, <coughs> to assemble the honneur that had survived revolutionary destruction, finding only the spurs, the so-called sword of Charlemagne, and its chief, and Charles V's scepter, Yvonne de created a new man justice and the crown of Charlemagne. Mm -hmm. 
Both executed in 1804 under his supervision by the goldsmith Martin Guillaume Biennet. Guillaume de Nord and Biennet drew, drew their inspiration for Bernard de Montfaucon's description of Charlemagne. Uh, oops, I think I'm missing a slide. Uh, description of Charlemagne's honneur in his historical survey of the French monarchy, the colossal Monument de la Monarchie Francoise, published in five volumes between 1729 and 1733. Napoleon commissioned a more permanent project. Let's see. Oh, here's my slide. So that's the Montfaucon plate. And interestingly, as is um, pointed out in um, a wonderful exhibition catalog on Regalia from the 80s, you see that the Manjustis, uh, the traditional Manjustis of the coronation, in this case is a left hand. But Montfaucon, his text says, don't, don't believe me, this is reversed. <laughs> so when Pianet actually designed it, they designed a left hand following the print. And it should be a right hand, obviously, because that's true justice. So, <laughs> confusion occurs in these things. So you see here in the frontispiece of the Décoration uh, for the Coronation of Napoleon, uh, the throne, obviously, that uh, uh, Ludwig Leben has shown us, the, uh, the crown of Charlemagne, so-called, the two uh, honor of the imperial honor, which are vertical, and then um, diagonally the two of uh, Charlemagne, the honor of Charlemagne, so the uh, Charles V scepter and um, the Manjustice. Napoleon commissioned a more permanent project to proclaim his union to the Merovingian and Carolingian dynasties. He decided to be buried in the Basilica of Saint Denis the traditional necropolis of the French kings, until the revolutionaries desecrated the royal tombs. <coughs> Napoleon ordered the restoration of the basilica, which had much suffered from the revolutionary sack. His architects, Jacques-Guillaume Le Grand, followed by Jacques Célorier, supervised by Fontaine, repaired the church as they planned, the imperial tombs, an imperial tomb uh, among the reinstalled sculptures of the Frankish rulers. And here's a project by Debray to install the statue of Charlemagne at Saint Denis. Finally, Napoleon strengthened his association with the Franks in print. For the albums Le Sacre de Sa Majesté l'Empereur Napoléon of 1805 and the Description des Cérémonies et des Fêtes qui ont eu lieu pour le couronnement de leur Majesté Napoléon, Empereur des Français et Rois d'Italie. Persico of 1807, Persier conceived decorated borders in which he reproduced medals minted for the event. One of them bears a, uh, bears a figure of the emperor standing on a shield supported by senators on the left and citizens on the right, in emulation of the Frankish custom used by chieftains to assert their power. Percy and Fontaine's bears their design for Napoleon's imperial throne on a circular Frankish shield and not a rectangular Roman shield. A comparison between Percy and Fontaine's neo-Gothic stage set and the decoration of the last revolutionary, pre-revolutionary coronation ceremony, that of Louis XVI, held at Notre Dame in the Heights on 11th June 1775, reveals a dramatic change in taste that occurred at the end of the century. At Heinz, Louis Giraud, theater designers for the Administration de l'Argenterie, Menu Plaisir et Affaires de la Chambre du Roi, better known as the Menu Plaisir, the agency responsible for all Ancien Régime balls, spectacles, and ceremonies, erected on the exterior of the cathedral a dark colonnade that framed the King's ceremonial march from the Archbishop's Palace to the cathedral. Inside the nave, he constructed another colonnade, colonnade which consisted of paired and gauge Corinthian columns flanking each one of the cathedral's piers. They recalled in their disposition the much admired east facade of the Louvre, begun in the 17th century, but only completed in the 18th. Giraud decorated the cathedral choir with a half circle of freestanding columns in the manner of the Royal Chapel, Chapel at Versailles. 
between each pair of columns and on the ground level, carved out, he carved out the cantilevered base supporting the colonnade. He installed panel theater boxes similar to those of Jean-Jacques Gabriel's opera at Versailles. Giraud's decor was rich in symbolic associations. By hinting to the east front of the Louvre, the chapel, and the opera at Versailles, Giraud transmuted the medieval church into a contemporary royal building. But this design, his design was more than a theatrical screen hiding the Gothic form still unpalatable to contemporaries. The neoclassical decoration of Louis XVI's coronation suggests that Giraud and his patrons understood the ideological and political usefulness of the mixture of classical and medieval forms, the so-called Greco-Gothic, first elaborated during the reign of Louis XVI's father, Louis XV. Like the empire, the last Ancien Régime ranks were fragile. In the wake of disastrous military campaigns that ended with the Treaty of Paris of 1763, which ceded France's North American colonies to the British, and in the public outrage regarding his scandalous personal life, Louis XV and his intendant des bâtiments, Abel François Poisson, Marquis de Vendière, and later de Marigny et de Ménard, devised an ambitious artistic program to bolster the prestige of a compromised regime. Daniel Abreau has shown that Marigny engineered this neoclassical reform not so much to obliterate the extravagances of the Rocaille associated with the early part of the king's reign, which as unruly, feminine style recalled his libidinous lifestyle, but, in re but to recast the king as a Gothic, pious, peace-loving monarch. Like Percy and Fontaine did for Napoleon, Marigny stressed the links that united the ailing Bourbon monarchy to its glorious Frankish past. The Greek Gothic strategy prompted the crown to sponsor the most important religious project of the second half of the 18th century in France, the Basilica of saint Geneviève in Paris. At saint Geneviève, the architect Jacques Germain Soufflot artfully synthesized modern church planning, medieval engineering, and classical decoration. Drawing on the architectural debates on the ideal church that animated the Enlightenment and his own interest in medieval structure, Soufflot revolutionized church design and pushed for a distinct Gallican forms. In France, post-Triantine churches followed the Italian model best exemplified by the Gesù in Rome, a nave delimited by tall arcades and living with appliqué orders. Soufflot, on the contrary, used the orders as the very structure of his edifice. Soufflot's Corinthian columns and the flat arches of their entablatures function in the same way as do the stone piers and arches of medieval churches. Of course, unlike those at saint Geneviève, the orders Giraud employed at Heinz were not structural. He captured nonetheless the spirit of Soufflot's design by giving the illusion of Gothic piers and pointed arches emerging from a classical colonnade. Like Soufflot, Giraud embraced medieval religious architecture and purified it with classical forms. Other monuments erected to glorify Louis XV express even more explicitly the theme of the Renaissance of the monarchy in a medieval crucible emerging from a classical past. For the monument to Louis XV erected in Reims, the sculptor Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne represented the king as a Frankish ruler on a shield carried by three warriors, like Napoleon, on the later coronation medals. He rested the sculptural group on a broken classical column, emphasizing the rejuvenation of the Bourbon rule by returning to its origins. As we have seen, the last Bourbons and Napoleon shared similar propagandist interests in the evocation of medieval history. How then can we account for the formal differences between Louis XVI and Napoleon's coronation ceremonies? And Notre Dame, Percy, and Fontaine justify their forms by their harmony to the architecture of the cathedral. Mm -hmm. Unlike Giraud and his Greco Gothic, he understood medieval architecture as a stylistically coherent formal system, if, even if their approach was far from archaeological. Louis XVI's and Napoleon's coronation albums highlight this difference of understanding. The perspective illustrating Giraud's Doric portico centers on the structure itself. 
It provides little information regarding its relationship to the cathedral's facade. So in the background, you see a bit of the cathedral's facade and then the side of the cathedral. By contrast, Percy and Fontaine's plates clearly show that they integrated the west facade of Notre Dame to their decor to achieve an overall composition. So this is the plan published by Percy and Fontaine. And the decor is um, at the bottom. And it's symmetrical to the cathedral. So it really understands the cathedral's portal as part of the big machine that they designed. And you see it even more clearly here. This is the portico I showed you, and the arcades that go on each side of the cathedral. Between the Heinz and, Go and Paris, Gothic had reached the status of an acceptable style that could be emulated, however blameable it remained, to the neoclassical doxa that Percy and Fontaine still relate in the Recueil des Décorations Intérieures. Percy and Fontaine's involvement with Alexandre Noir at the Musée des Monuments Français was key in this broadening of their formal repertoire. The musée had a profound impact both on the development, both on the development of historicism in painting and architecture and a revival of Gothic, or more properly, the style troubadour, its sentimental variant. So here's I'm showing you a painting by Rivoal, which is a style troubadour, troubadour painting. So this this kind of sentimental view of, um, of the Middle Ages. The Noir stage at the museum, at his museum's French sculptures and architectural fragments salvaged from revolutionary destruction within a chronological framework. He laid out each room to capture the style of a particular century and with theatrical flair heightened its evo evo evocative aspect. In collaboration with Fontaine and Claude Louis Bernier, Percy illustrated the museum's catalogs. He composed frontispieces as collage of works of sculpture and architecture, much as Renoir had laid out the museum's rooms. And there's a wonderful exhibition in Paris right now on the Musée des Monuments Français, a wonderful catalog, and Jean-Philippe has a great essay on Percy and Renoir. So I'm showing you a project or a frontispiece of the, uh, of the catalogs of the Musée des Monuments Français. So the same strategy that we talked about repeatedly uh, during uh, today's uh, presentations, this kind of fragments that compose a whole, is meant to capture the spirit of here, the Renaissance. Um, um, but also the rooms of the Musée des Monuments Français were the same, were structured in the same way, more or less, although archaeologically not correct, since Lenoir was extremely cavalier at actually staging pieces of history. The use of medieval references to assert dynastic continuity and personal piety implemented in the decoration of Napoleon's coronation ceremony at Notre Dame was already in place under the last Bourbon. Marigny Marshall, the Greco-Gothic, the, the fusion of Greco-Roman and medieval architecture, to bolster Louis XV's popularity. By the end of the century, however, a new historical consciousness resulted in a more conspicuous, if decorative, use of Gothic forms. Paradoxically, the apparently inflexible apostle of neoclassicism ushered historicism in architecture, which will rivet architects and theorists throughout the 19th century. 